So we're on Daf Yud Aleph, Umed Aleph. And again, we'll get you out of here in about a half an hour today. But it's uh, just, just to review where we're holding. We have a machlokis between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish that we were subjecting to a brisa that's problematic according to either of them. Let's just review the machlokis. Rabbi Yochanan uh, and Reish Lakish discussed the following case. A man does chalitza with his brother's widow, and then he goes ahead and marries her, which is forbidden. Everyone agrees that there's an Isser Losa say that he's committed. There's not an Isser Kare, so they're officially married. Uh, there's Tfisis Kiddushin, they're halachically married, but he's in violation of an Isser Losa say that he's not a Kivin Shalom Banash of Lo Yivne, that he's not allowed to marry a woman that he did Chalitza with. The machlokas between Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish is what is the status of the other brothers vis a vis the Chalitza, that woman who got Chalitza? And also, what is the status of them vis a vis the co wife? Okay, all of the brothers vis-a-vis the co-wives. So, according to Reish Lakish, all of the brothers and all of the co-wives have a status of an Isser Erva, that there's the Isser of Eish goes back on them. And therefore, um, the only two people that have an Isser Losase, just a regular mitzvah Losase, are the Cholets and the Chalutza, the man who did Chalitza and the woman who received Chalitza. But all of the other siblings and the co-wives all have the status of Erva. And therefore, it would stand to reason that in that situation, um, uh, okay, but that, anyway, so that's Rish Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan says that in that situation, since there was a moment when all of the co-wives, including this woman who got Chalitza, where there was only an Isra Lo Sase, or there was, they were all permitted at one point to marry, right, there was a Zika, that zika does not fly off permanently. There's a remnant of that zika such that all that lasts upon all of the siblings and on all of the tsaras is a mitzvah slow sase. Such that if one of the brothers went ahead and were to marry the, uh, this woman, uh, one of the tsaras, he also would only incur mitzvah slow sase. And the nafkamina would be is that let's say a situation where Shimon goes ahead and does chalitza with Ruvain's widow, and then Shimon goes ahead and marries her and is halachically married to her and then Shimon dies so this woman now falls to Yibo is she an Isser Erva to the other brothers or is she not an Isser Erva according to Reish Lakish she's an Isser Erva so there's no Zika there's no Chalitza or Yibo but according to Rabbi Yochanan there is a Zika because there's only an Isser Lav on her there's not a Mitz in Isser Kares okay so the Gemara now had said that this is a prob- this following Bryce is problematic, both according to Rabbi Yochanan and according to Reish Lakish. Because if you look at the first part of the Bryce, this is what we saw yesterday, the first part of the Bryce says that if Shimon goes ahead, gives Chalitza to this woman, and then goes ahead and marries her illicitly, and then he dies, then she needs to get Chalitza from the brothers, from one of the brothers. So you see that there's Zika, that's a proof to Rabbi Yochanan that there's only a mitzvah slow sase, there's no Isser Kares. So Reish Lakish said back to him, okay, that first part of the Brisa supports you, but what about the second part of the Brisa? The second part of the Brisa says, Amad Echad Min Ha'achim V'Kidsha, that if one of the brothers were to present the Yevama, this woman uh, who was married to, the, to Shimon and then Shimon died, and if, she, if one of the brothers was to go to try to give her Kiddushin, ain't la alav klum, then there's no valid Kiddushin whatsoever. In other words, uh, like, like Rashi explains, that um, what, what, is, what is the case? Instead of Shimon gave her Chalitza, and instead of Shimon going ahead and marrying her, one of the other brothers tries to marry her. That's the case of the second part of the Brisa. In that situation, what does the Brisa say? The Brisa says it's not a valid marriage at all. But according to what you just said, Rabbi Yochanan, that as soon as a woman gets chalitza, then all of the brothers remain with an Isra Losase. So then why is the Kiddushan not a Kiddushan? There should at least be a Tfisas Kiddushan, even though it's an illicit marriage, but the Kiddushan should still work. So this is a Kasha on Rabbi Yochanan. The Reisha is a Kasha on Reish Lakish. The Seifa is a Kasha on Rabbi Yochanan. The Gemara had tried to answer, saying that the Seifa goes according to Rabbi Akiva, but the Gemara says, no, that's not going to work out in the verbiage. And that's where we're up to, at the very top line of Yud Aleph and Aleph. Ravashi, Savar Lakar Reish Lakish, Umetaris Lakar Reb Shimon. So Ravashi actually paskins like Reish Lakish. Rav Ashi feels that 
there's a mitz- Isser Kares that is upon all of the brothers and all of the tsaras. once a man does Chalitza to the Chalitza, and therefore he's going to explain the Brisa and say that it, the, the part that's problematic to Reish Lakish goes like Rib Shimon. Now which Rib Shimon are we talking about? Reb Shimon was the one that we were talking about yesterday. He talked about a case of Eishas Achiv Shalohaya Ba'olamo. According to Reb Shimon, sometimes Eishas Achiv Shalohaya Ba'olamo will be prohibited to this woman who he ne- from the brother that he never met, and sometimes will be permitted. Now, what in the world does that have to do with this price that you'll see in just a second? Ravina Savrla Kareb Yochanan and Mataritz Karabonan. Ravina, however, holds like Reb Yochanan that there's only an Isser Lav on, on all of the members of the household, both the brothers and the tsaras, and therefore it will explain the Brisa, the problematic part of the Brisa, according to the Chachamim, also regarding Eishas Ach Shalohaya Ba'olamo. Let's just review the, the Machlokas between the Chachamim and Rav Shimon about Eishas Ach Shalohaya Ba'olamo. Ruvain dies, leaves over a widow. Shimon is alive when Ruvain dies, but Levi is only born after Ruvain dies. That's called an Eishas Ach Shalohayu Ba'olamo. If, when Levi is born, this woman has not yet had Yibum with Shimon, so then everyone agrees, both the Chacham and Reb Shimon agree, that this woman is permanently usher to Levi, such that if Shimon were to go ahead and do Yibum afterwards, and then Shimon would die, Levi would never be able to marry her. That's Eishas Ach Shalohayu Ba'olamo. However, this is the point of argument between Rav Shimon and the Chachamim. Ruvain dies, leaves over his widow. Shimon does Yibum to the widow, and then Levi is born. Since Levi was born after Shimon did Yibum, and he finds this woman in a state married to a brother that is alive when he is born, then if Shimon dies, according to Rav Shimon, the widow is permitted for him to do Yibum. The Chachamim disagree, and they say no. Once she was married to a brother, that was not in the, that was that was died before Levi was born, even if she later married Shimon, a brother that was alive when Levi was born. It doesn't make a difference. She's permanently ushered to him. That's the machlokas between Reb, the Rabbanon and Reb Shimon. So now let's explain this brisa. Okay, so um, so Ravashi Savar la Kareish Lakish or Metaris la Reb Shimon. He goes Ravashi holds like Reb Lakish. He explains as follows: Hacholitz the Yivim Tov Achazer Vikidsha. That the first part of the Brisa had said that if a man gives chalitza to the widow, to, if Shimon gives chalitza to Ruvain's widow, and then he goes ahead and illicitly marries her, and then Shimon dies, she needs to get chalitza from the brothers. Man achin, what brothers are we talking about? Achin hayilodim. These are the brothers that are born after the fact. This is referring to Levi, who's born after Shimon did Chalitza and after he married her. Since Levi only discovers this woman as Shimon's wife, therefore you look at anything that happened before Levi was born as being irrelevant, null and void, vis-a-vis Levi, and therefore even though uh, she was married previously to a brother that was not alive when Levi was born, nevertheless that's not Eishas Achiv Shalohaya Ba'olam, it's got no consequences, and therefore Levi, there is a Zika between this widow and Levi. Levi can't marry her, but he still has to do chalitza. Keman kareb shimen. And that goes like reb shimen. Amad echel min hanoladim v'kidsha. However, if one of the brothers who was alive when shimen did the chalitza tries to give her kiddushin, so ein la alav klum, then that's, that's nothing. Because according to Reish Lakish, once Shimon gave her chalitza, there's an Isser Kares now on this woman on all of the other brothers that were alive at the time of the chalitza, keman ke resh lakish. That goes like resh lakish. So that explains the b'raisa like resh lakish. Ravina savr la ke reb yochan and umataritz la aliba de rabbanan. Ravina, on the other hand, will interpret the whole b'raisa like reb yochan. And will explain it like this. Hacholetz li yivim tov v'chazer v'kitsh etzricha chalitza min ha'achet. So the first part says that if a man gives chalitza to, his, to the widow, to the yavama, and then he goes ahead and illicitly gives her kiddushin, and then Shimon, this guy, dies. So then she needs to get chalitza from the brothers. Man achin, achin hanoladim. This is the, because there's a zika, like Rabbi Yochanan said, there's only a misfas lo sase on all of the brothers that did not do chalitza. Come on, ke Rabbi Yochanan. That's straightforward like Rabbi Yochanan. However, amar echa bin hayilodim v'kidsha, ein lo alav klom. But now, if later, Levi, who was born, Afterwards, if Shimon then dies 
and, and Levi tries to give her Kiddushin, Keman Kerabonin, according to the Rabbonin, he's an Eshesach Shalohayo Baolamo, there's no Zika whatsoever, and therefore he try, his attempt to give this woman Kiddushin, even though Levi was born after the, the Chalitza was already done, it's irrelevant. Since Levi is in, it, to this woman is an Eshesach Shalohayo Baolamo, there's no Zika, and therefore his attempt to Kiddushin won't work because she's an Eser Erva. What, what does this have to do with Levi, considering in fact that the Zika was there regardless whether Levi was alive or not, the first marriage was Chal. There was a relationship, right? The Zika is from the time of the first, from the first brother, right? In other words, regardless of when Levi is born, there was still a relationship between this woman and his deceased brother. So, but, but if uh, you're say, asking according to Reb Shimon, I assume. Yeah, you're asking yeah, according to Reb yeah. Shimon. Reb Shimon says what occurred before Levi was born is irrelevant. The only time it's relevant is if Levi is born at a time where this woman is waiting to do yubum from her deceased husband. Then Levi's an Eshesach. She's in, to him, she's an Eshesach. Shalohayo But if she's married at the time when Levi is born, then you'd look at anything, everything else that happened before then is Inco- inconsequential vis-a-vis Levi. That's the argument. Okay, Itmar. Habual yevama ubo echad min ha'achen al tsarasa. So, in a similar case, a man um, has re- a man does yibum to the Ruvain dies, and he leaves over two widows, two women. Shimon does yibum with Rachel, and Levi does yibum with Leah. Even though the halacha is Bias echad hubona, the mitzvah of yibum is only with one of the tsaras, not with both, and the other tsara really is forbidden. Once one of the women has done yibum, all of the other tsaras are forbidden to the brothers. The question is, what is the nature of the prohibition? So pligi barav achav eravina, chad omer bikares v'chad omer baase. So this is a machlokas similar to the machlokas Rabbi Yochanan Reish Lakish. What is the stigma of this tsara once the other woman has done yibum? Is she now go back to an iser karis of eshesach, or is there only an iser lav because of the zika that was previously on her? Hmm. So tosfos is goris v'chadomer below sase, I should say. Man domer bikaris karish lakish, man domer baase karib yochanan. If you hold that there's karis on this tsara, it's because he holds like Reish Lakish that once Chalitz or Yubim was done with one woman, all the other women and all the other brothers go back to an Isser of Eshesach. But if you hold like Rabbi Yochanan, that once Zika sets in, Zika removes the Isser Kares permanently, so then this Tzara only has an Isser of uh, an Isser uh, Losase. There's no Isser Kares. Okay, let's go on to the next case. Amar of Yochanan, Amar Rav, Tzara Sota Asura. My time to Maksiv Baka Arayos. So Rav Paskins that the Tsara of Asota. Now this is a case where Ruvain was married to two women, Rachel and Leah. Rachel goes ahead and commits adultery. So the consequences of that we'll learn about in just a moment. But since she's an adulteress, she does not fall for Yibum, nor does her Tsara fall for Yibum. And the reason is, is because the Torah calls an adulteress a woman who became Tame. And the word term tuma is used by the arayos as well. Therefore, just like the arayos don't fall for yibum and they exempt their tsaras from falling from yibum, so too is a sota, so too is an adulteress. Masiv Rav Chizda. So Rav, she drink and it's drink no, 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 no. We're talking about an adulteress. We're not talking about a sota that you're thinking of in Parshas Naso. A woman who committed adultery. For, for, That's for, not a, a suffix. Uh, Right. Well, we'll see. The Gemara is going to talk about a suffix later. We're talking about an actual mm-hmm. woman who committed adultery. It's corroborated. We don't give her anything to drink. So, Masiv Rav Chizda. So, Rav Chizda challenges this. Rav Chizda says, look at the following b'risa. Rabbi Shimon Omer, bi'asa o chalitzasa me'achiv shel rishon poteres tsarasa. Now, this b'risa is talking about the following case. We're going to learn at the very end of Yavamos, we're going to learn about all about the laws of Aguna. You know, about, you know what an Aguna is? A woman who, well, the classic case of Aguna is not what we think it is. The classic case of Aguna is a woman who doesn't know for sure, doesn't have evidence that her husband is dead, but there is circumstantial evidence that her husband is dead. The Chachamim, in many instances, allowed that woman to remarry. So normally you need two witnesses to allow a woman to remarry, but in this case, one witness is sufficient. She goes and she has the testimony of one witness that her husband is dead. He went to some far away place, never came back. One witness said, I saw your husband die. The, the base, right, the battlefield, 
based on will under certain circumstances, give her permission to remarry. Mm-hmm. So she goes ahead, based on that testimony, forgetting about Khalid or Yibam for just a second, she goes ahead and remarries. She goes ahead and gets married to another guy, just a stranger, okay? Now, in that situation, let's say the first husband comes back. So the halacha is that the rabbis required her, even though technically she never was really married to the second guy, but because she did it with the sanction of the chachamim, she has to get a get from both her first husband and her second husband. Now, in that situation, while she's waiting for that get, what happens if her first husband dies and the first husband has brothers? (laughs) So in that situation, she really does, there is a zika there. So she falls for yibum, and so in that situation, if the first brother, if, um, if the first husband dies, then one of the brothers of the first husband goes in and does Yibam or Chalitza with her, then the Tsaras are also exempt. So what you see from here is that there is a Zika. There's a Zika to the adulterous woman. She, she, she committed an act of adultery. I mean, after all, what did she do? She go, went ahead and got married to another man. So she's being unfaithful to her first husband during his lifetime. And yet we still see that if, the, if that man dies, there's still a zika. How can you tell me that she's like an erva? So, Amr lecha rav, amina lecha ana sota de araisa, vat amart li sota de rabbanon, question mark. Is I don't understand the comparison. We're, that's not a real adulteress. She got married with to her Bastin. second husband with the Bastin's blessing. Yeah. So how can you hold her to blame? The only time we say that there's no Zika whatsoever is if she willfully and maliciously went ahead and committed adultery on her husband. Here, we look at her like a woman who was raped. Yeah. A woman who was raped is not a Sota. She can go back to her husband. They can have a successful marriage afterwards. It's not her fault. Mm. So why are you comparing apples and oranges? So the Gemara says, Udukarila, my Karila. So the Kohai Gemara says, I don't understand. That's so obvious, that distinction. What were you thinking to even bring this as a challenge, Reb Chista, to begin with? So Kesavar called the Takon Rabban and came to Raisa Takon. The answer is, is that Reb Chista's thinking was, well, look, the rabbis call her a Sota de Rabbanan. They call her a rabbinic Sota such that she's not permitted to go back to her first husband. Right? We penalize her. That we say, we only give you our blessing and remarry if you're absolutely sure that he's dead. Mm-hmm. And you've got to do your due diligence. So if he ends up coming back, we penalize her and we say that you're not allowed to remain married to your first husband, even though technically you are. Why? Because we call you a rabbinic sota, right, in a sense. So the fact that she's a rabbinic sota, I might have thought, says Rav Chizda, that by declaring her a sota, midr Rabbanan, all of the laws of a sota apply to her, and therefore she wouldn't even fall for yibam or chalitza, and, uh, and therefore we would sort of like remove everything from her, and therefore... Um, um, uh, the most that you would be have to give her would be chalitza to either her or the tsara, and therefore uh, this would have um, th- th- this would have proved our point. And but yet kamash malan, no, you can do yibum with the tsara, that uh, the tsara is not precluded from from doing yibum with, but by a real sota, not only can you not do yibum with the tsara, but there's no zika whatsoever. So masiv ravashi. So Ravashi challenges with the following Bryce in Masech Sota. It says that if a woman was secluded with a man, now we, here we don't know whether she actually committed adultery or not, but we know that she went into seclusion with a man, then the halacha is, is that she's not allowed to be with her husband, nor if the husband is a Kohen, is she allowed to eat truma. The imes, and then if the, ko, if the husband dies, cholets is velomis yabemis. She gets chalitza from one of the brothers. And so what you see, it's a kasha on Rav, because Rav says that there's no zika whatsoever, because she's not, uh, she's, she's like an erva. So, Amar lecha Rav, amina lecha anasaita vadai ve'amart li at sota safek. So Rav says, of course, it's, again, apples and oranges. That's talking about a woman where we don't know whether she was adulterous or not, whether she was unfaithful. I'm talking about where we have two witnesses who say for sure that she committed adultery. And in that situation, there's no zika whatsoever. So frek the Gemara, but why should you make a distinction? So why are you telling me that a, a, a definite adulteress 
there's no zika. Why? Because the Torah calls her tame. But so to suffix nami tuma ksivaba. There's also tuma that's written in the context of a suffix sota. The case of the Torah, the Tanya. And how do I know this? Rabbi Yossi ben Keeper Omer Mishum Rabbi Elazar. Hamachzer grusha so min hanisu in asura asura min ha'erisin muteres. Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur says that if a man divorces his wife and then she goes ahead and gets remarried. So it depends whether or not she's going to be prohibited to him, depending upon whether that marriage was a full marriage which was consummated with Nisuin, or whether it was only a Kiddushan that he gave her, but he never consummated the marriage. So according to Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur, if he only gave her Kiddushan and he never consummated the marriage of the second husband, then, and then he died, let's say, she's allowed to go and remarry her first husband. It's only if she consummated the second marriage then she's also permanently to her first husband. And how does he know this? Mishum shenamar acharei asher hu because it says, no, she has become tummy. The word tummy means she's been defiled physically. And therefore, if she hasn't been physically intimate with her second husband, she can always go back to her first husband. So the Chachamim say we disagree. Anytime a woman, has, a woman has entered into a marriage with a second husband, even if there was no intimacy, she's permanently forbidden to her first husband. I, what do you do with the three words in the Pasuk of Acharei Asher Hutama'a? which means she was physically defiled, Larabo Soto Shinistera. Those three words are not talking about a machzer grusha, so a man remarrying his divorcee. Those three words are talking about an actual adulteress. An actual adulteress, that's talking about a woman who was not known for sure to be an adulteress, but is suspected of adultery because she had she had stira, that she went ahead and secluded herself mm-hmm. with another man. And therefore, you see, according to the Chachamim, the word Tumah is used in the context of a suspected adulteress, so why should it be any different from a known adulteress? So, umay nistera, so, so the Gemara's answer is, and the, the Rashash changes the girsi here, he says, this is the answer. My nistera, nivala. What does the word nistera mean in the Bryce? It's not referring to a suspected adulteress, it's referring to a definitive adulteress. In other words, the, the term tumah is only used in the context of a definite adulteress, and the, the word tumah is not used in the context of a suspected adulteress. So, frak the Gemara, vamai kari le nistera. Why did the Bryce call her secluded if it means to say, no, she's def- definitively an adulteress? Lishna ma'al yanakat. It's speaking in euphemisms. Nivala tumah behedjik I think we're asking another question. Question. But why do you need the words Zacharei Asher Hutama'a to talk about a woman who definitely committed adultery? That's already written explicitly in Parshas Naso, because it says over there, Venister of that if a woman became defiled, she became tummy because she definitely committed adultery. So the Gemara answer is Lameka Malab Balav. The answer is, is that if I just had the words in Parshas Naso with the Parsha of Sota, there's no mitzvah slosa say that prohibits her to go back to her husband. The words Zacharei Asher Hutama'a says, is that the man may not take her back. You cannot take her back. Why? Because she's committed adultery. Okay, for Rabbi Yosef ben Kippur, lav besota lesle, vafilu zanainomi. So, but it turns out that Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur would hold that if a woman commits definitively adultery, even if we know we have two witnesses who committed adultery, there's no iser lav in the Torah to prohibit her from going back to the husband. My time havaya ve'ishus ksivba. And the reason why Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur says that a woman who's been unfaithful to her husband is still permitted to her husband is because he looks at the Pasuk and says the only time a woman may not go back to her husband after being intimate with another man is if she marries another man because that's the context of what the law of Machzer Grushas was talking about. Her husband divorces her, she goes and marries another man, is intimate with that new husband, that's when the Torah prohibits her from going back to her first husband. But if a woman committed adultery, according to Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur, and she never married the adulterer, so the halach is she's still permitted back to her original husband. Isn't but that's that? not the, how we paskin. We paskin that once a woman commits adultery, she's a surah labal, a surah laboyal, she's permanently prohibited to both her husband and the adulterer. You can make kedushin with Bia, so why can't you say that that nivala is a. a, 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 a how can a woman have tefisus kedushin when she's married? She's a married woman. She's a married woman. 
a woman commits adultery, she's married. She just she can't. There can't be no tefisus kedushin on an aishas well, ish. Regarding ibum, you say there is zikos and all sorts of things attached. Because the Torah gives a specific dispensation. We'll have to I have to I have to go finish. I'm sorry, I have to go finish the daf. So b'aminei rav Yehuda me rav Sheishas hamachzer grushaso mishenisays v'meis tsarasa mahu. So now we have another related question. A man goes ahead, divorces his wife, she gets remarried, then her second husband dies, and the first husband remarries her illicitly. It's illegal. But there is Tfisis Kiddushin. So now the question is, what is the status of her tsar? Now, if that man who is Machzer Grushasu, he dies, and he leaves over this wife that he was illicitly married to, and he leaves a tsara. What is the status of the tzara? Does the tzara, uh, can you do yibum with her or not? Aliba de Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur loti boilach, kevin damar Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur tumba b'machsir grushasu d'chsiva tzarasa kemosa. So according to Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur, it shouldn't really be a question. Since he says the word tuma in the Pasuk is talking about that very case of a machzer grushaso, and tuma equates us to an erva, so therefore just like this machzer grushaso woman is an erva, she therefore patras her tzara from yibum. So there's no yibum in this, and there's, there's no yibum or chalitza to this tzara. The imishum d'chsiv ba to'eva he, maybe you'll argue no. By the Torah, when it talks about a machzer grushaso, it says to'eva he. She is an abomination. He is a mute. Maybe it means he toeva, uh, uh, maybe only she's a toeva, but her tsara is not a toeva. The tsara can do yibum. So the Gemara says, no, that's not what it means. He toeva vein boneha toeva, ha tsarasa toeva. That's not what it means. It means that she is an abomination, but her children are not, which means that if a man is machser grushaso and he has more children with her, those children are not mamzerim. But what she has done is an abomination. What he has done, what he and she have done, is an abomination. But the kids are, are still kosher kids. Okay, so that's uh, that's what it means. But therefore, we see that the tsara, according to Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur, is the tsara of an isha temeya, and an isha temeya equals erva. And therefore, just like by cases of erva, you patur the tsara from yibum and chalitza. So too over here, kiti boila chalib de rabbanan. The question is only according to the chachamim. Afal gav de omer rabbanan tuma besotu hudichsev. The chachamim basically tell you the words acharei asher hu tamaa, even though it's written in the pasuk of machzer grushaso. Is not talking about a machzer grushaso. It's talking about a completely different woman, an adulteress. And if that's the case, uh, therefore maybe we could argue that this machzer grushaso woman is not called a temeya, and therefore the tsara falls for yubim. But on the other hand, you could argue ein mikrayotza midei pshuto. You could argue that no, since it's contextually written in the context of. Machzer Grushaso, maybe for these purposes, for the Tzara purposes, she is called an Isha Temeya, and therefore the Tzara is Potter, for this, there's no Zika to the Tzara. Odilma Kevin Di'i Akir Yakir, or maybe no. Maybe they're applying the, word, the words Acharei Asher Hutama to a Sota, means that the Machzer Grushaso is not a Tame woman, and therefore the Tzara does fall for Yibam. So Ika da Amri, others learn that Aliba de Rabbana loti boiloch, that no, it's not that there's no kasha for Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur, uh, there's no shaila for him, but rather there's no shaila for the Chachamim. Kevin dis akir is akir, because once the words acharei asher hutama are removed from the context of machzer grushaso and applied to sota, then for sure the tsara of a machzer grushaso falls to yibo. Kiti boiloch aliba de Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur mai. But the question is according to Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur. Afal gav darminim Rabbi Yossi ben Kippur but we could argue like this. Even though the Torah says that the Machzer Grushasa woman is Tame, but yet it also says that only she is a Toeva. He Toeva vein Sarasa Toeva, and which means that the Tsar is not a Toeva, therefore she would fall for Yibum. Odilma he Toeva vein Bonea Toeva and Hatsarasa Toeva. Or maybe that's not the way to learn it. Maybe you're supposed to understand it as no. Uh, only she's a toeva, but her children are not a toeva, but the tsara is a toeva, and therefore she doesn't fall for yibum. So, Amar Leh, so to answer your question, whether the question is according to the Chacham and whether it's according to Rip Yossi ben Kippur, the question is still a standing question. What is the status of a tsara of a machzer grushasa woman? Does she fall for yibum or not? Is there zika to her or not? So, Amar Leh Tenisua, so he says, we learned this already. Haisa echas kashera ve echas pesula, im haya choletz choletz le pesula, vim haya miyabim miyabim le kashera. So the Brises is a very interesting statement. It says that if a man dies leaving over two widows, one widow is kosher and one widow is puzzle. Now, what do those words mean? We'll see in just a second. So if he's going to do yibum, he should do yibum to the 
kosher woman, and if he's going to do chalitza, he should do chalitza to the pasul woman. So my kesheira, my pasula. What do those words mean, kosher and pasul? Ilay ma kesheira, kesheira la alma pasula, pasula la alma. Maybe you'll tell me that kosher and pasul refer to the fact that is she permitted to a kohen or not? Maybe that's what it means. Maybe the decedent was married. One woman that he was married to was a was a divorcee from a prior marriage, and the other woman was a virgin when he married her. And in that situation. Uh, the, one, the woman who was a divorcee is usher to a Kohen, and the woman who was a virgin is permitted to marry a Kohen. And what the Bryce is telling you is that even if you, the brother, are a Yisrael, and you're allowed to be married to either one, you should only, uh, if you're going to do chalitza, do chalitza to the woman who's the divorcee. Don't do chalitza to the, to the woman who's just the widow. And if you're going to do yibum, only do yibum to the woman who's a widow, not to the woman who's a divorcee. But the Gemara says, I don't understand. Why would it tell me that? If you're a Yisrael, why shouldn't you be able to do whatever you want? If you can do, if you're a Yisrael, it shouldn't make a difference to you whether or not she's going to be able to marry a Kohen afterwards or not. So, so therefore, you must conclude that the Bryce is saying that this woman is either kosher to him or puzzled to him. So what's the case? We're talking about a case where the decedent, Ruvain, was married to two women. One was his machzer grushaso, so that she was usher to him and usher to the yavam. And the other woman was a regular tsar. So, and it says that if you want to do yibum, you can do yibum only to the kosher woman. So, what do you see from here? You have a raya that the tsara of a machzer grushaso is permitted to yibum. So, the Gemara says, lo. No, I can interpret the Bryce another way. La'olam kishere kishere la'alma pesula pesula la'alma. It's not talking at all about a machzer grushasa in that Bryce. The Bryce is talking about a, one widow was a divorcee and one widow is just a regular widow. I and the, the Yavim is not a, is not a Kohen, is a Yisrael. So, utika amar, tkiven de lididei chaz yamay nafka leimina. And your question was, what difference does it make if he's a Yisrael? Let him do whatever he wants to whichever woman he wants. Bishum de Rav Yosef. It's because of Rav Yosef's principle. Da'ama Rav Yosef, kan shana that a person should not take perfectly good drinking water from his well and spill it out just because he doesn't need it. It could be that other people will need it. It's like baltashchis, right? Don't destroy something wantonly just because you don't need it doesn't mean someone else is not going to need it. So what does that have to do with our case? What we're talking about is as follows. Uh, two women fall for Yibo. One is a divorcee. The other one is a widow. If I go ahead as a Yisrael, the brother who's a Yisrael, and I do chalitza, I don't want to marry either one of them. So if I do chalitza to the one who's just a widow, what am I doing? I'm taking a perfectly kosher woman and passing her for the kahuna. So I could say, well, what do I care? What difference does it make to me? I'm not going to marry either one of them. You're right, it doesn't make a difference to you. But why wantonly do something destructive to this woman and preclude her from marrying a kohen ever again? That's what the Bryce is talking about. It's not talking at all about a Machsa Grushasa. So you have no raya whether or not the Tsar of a Machsa Grushasa falls to Yubam. Toshma, look at the next Bryce. So this Bryce says that if a man remarries his divorcee and then he dies, then both this woman and her Tsara have to get Chalitza. So the Gemara says, one second. First of all, this price doesn't make any sense. Since when do two women re- from the, married to the same man require chalitza? So therefore you have to read it, Ela Ema, oh he o tsarasa. So you have to say either she or the tsara gets chalitza. So what do you see from here? We've proven from here that the tsara of Amaksa Grushasa cannot do Yibum. That was what we were trying to find out the whole time. So the Gemara says, but wait a minute. But but one second. The Bryce's language was bizarre to begin with, and you had to explain it. So explain it slightly differently. So read it as follows. That either you give chalitza to the Machsar Grushasa woman, or you do either Yibam or chalitza to the Tzara. Because since, you're, since you have to shtup words into the b'risa anyway, so you might as well read it in a way which, which supports the halacha, that the tzara falls to you. So you can't prove anything from this b'risa. Amar Rabbi Chiyabar Abba, Rabbi Yochanan boy. So Rabbi Yochanan had a similar question. He said, Hamachzer Grushasa Mishanese Tzara Samahu. It was the same question. He said, what is the status of a tzara of a Hamachzer Grushasa woman? So Amar Le Rabbi Amibiti boy lachi gufa. So he said to Rabbi Yochanan, why don't you ask about the woman herself, the Machsa Grushasa woman. Maybe you could do even Yibum. Uh, is there the possibility of doing Yibum with her? 
So he gufa lo kami bayli. So Rabbi Yechon says, no, for sure, I don't, I'm not even asking about that, because the Amrin and Kalva Chomer b'mutr lo aser, Rabbi Aser lo lo kol shekein. Look, the husband that she was married to, she's aser to, right? Because he was machzer grusha, because he remarried her after she had been previously married. So then certainly, to the brother of her husband, she should be usher to. If she was usher to her own husband, then surely the brother who's coming, Mikoach the husband, surely she's going to be usher to, because he's only allowed to marry her to do Yibam. But if, if she was usher to her husband to begin with, and he's only coming, Mikoach the husband, so then surely she should be an Ashes Ach to him, and, she should, and, uh, and he should not be allowed to marry her. So, so the Gemara says, "Kel mi ba yelit tsarasamai." My question is, what about the tsar of the machzer grushasa woman? Mi olam kal v'chomer lemidchi tsara olo. Could you use that kal v'chomer and say, "Look, she's tainted the pool for herself with her own husband, so surely she's tainted the pool with her brother-in-law, and not only that, but she's also tainted the pool with the tsara of her husband as well." Or, no, maybe she's only tainted it for herself, but her tsara is allowed to have yubam. So Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak Masni Hachi, Rav Nachman Bar Yitzchak said that the question was asked as follows, Amr Rav Chia Bar Abba, Boi Rav Yochanan, HaMachzer Grushasa Mishini Seismahu, that he wasn't asking the question on the tsara, he was asking the question on the Machzer Grushasa woman herself. Amr Le Rabbi Ami Viti Boi Lach Tsarasa, why don't you ask the question about the tsara, what is her status? Tsarasa lo kami boili, de lo olim kal v'chom lo midchi tsara. That's not, I don't have that question. I know for sure that the tsara can do yibum because just because she's tainted the water, tainted the pool for herself uh, and, cert, you know, for, and, for, and for her uh, brother-in-law doesn't mean that she's tainted it for her tsara. Eloki kami boili hi gufa. But my question is no. Maybe even though she was in an illicit marriage with her own husband, but mi olim kal v'chom re b'moka mitzvah lo. Maybe that argument to say that if she was usher to her husband, then surely she should be usher to the Yavam, is not true because there's a mitzvah der rice of Yibam. And maybe the mitzvah der rice of Yibam will override even the stigma of this woman being usher to her own husband. And therefore the Gemara says, So we're going to go back to that b'risa that we saw before. That if one woman was kasher, one woman was pasul, which is very cryptic, we don't know what it means. If he wants to do chalitza, let him do chalitza to the pasul one. If he wants to do yibum, he should do yibum to the, to, the, to, the, to the kosher one. And we're going to go through the whole rigmarole again of suggesting that this b'risa is talking about the tzara of a machzer grushas. So, and yet you see that the Masu Grushasu herself, you cannot do Yibam to, you can only do Chalitza. And the Gemara is going to say, no, this price is not necessarily talking about Masu Grushasu, it's talking about two women, one is a divorcee, one's a widow, and we're talking about whether she can, uh, how you're supposed to treat her so that the, the regular widow can marry a Kohen afterwards. And that you'll follow up with tomorrow, Mirza Shem. Have a wonderful Yantiv.